I'll do a recording in case people. Oh. I don't know. That's what Tom did. I'll just follow suit. Good morning. Morning. Hi, Randy. Hey there. Just want to crack open a brew. Oh, I'm, it's V8. It snowed by me, so I'm going to have to shovel. How's everybody else? I think we're due later in the week. Okay. We're, we're getting your stuff. Bro. I know. Jen is saying, where's the V8 sponsorship? I totally, you know what I can do is I could put an Amazon affiliate link to V8. And then it's like I'm cheating into the system. I really hope to get V8 to mail me. We'll see. You know, I'm right. A long, long time ago, my fig kids figured out that um, with most food products, there's an 800 number where you can call if there's a complaint about the food. But if you call that number and instead of a complaint, if you tell them, man, I just wanted to call and tell you how great I think your product is. It, it's so it so catches them off guard. They have all these coupons that they give out to people as like, you know, con consolation prize for, I, you know, I didn't like my cornflakes or whatever. Um, and they will, in fact, mail you coupons for free product uh, just just because it's oh, it was so great. And uh, uh, I, I can't tell you how many times my kids would they'd sit around at night and they would just like go through the kitchen, their favorite food products, calling the 800 numbers and telling them, man, you know, I really, really love your product. And then like two weeks later, we get a bunch of coupons for, you know, whatever free Nutrigrain bars or whatever, whatever it was they were calling about. It was it was pretty cool. That's amazing. So awesome. Well, I'm, I think I'm going to go and click on this link, Barry. What do you think? J dive in like, um, so is that, are you waiting for later? No, no. Uh, so I'm going to be playing oh, yeah, that I mean, tune. So I think maybe I'll play my version first and then hear what the real version sounds like later, right after. Cool. This is a, uh, Mike Manieri tune called Las Dos Laredas. Anybody familiar with that one? I love it. It's so cool. Anyway, two I, Loretta's. I guess, yeah. Um, so for folks that have not been here or weren't here last week, I showed off my midified vibraphone. I, uh, I did it myself. Um, I also have a link in the, uh, I have to post it. I really uh, like that play on words now that I notice it. What was that? Midified. Oh, yeah. Um, let me go to paste that link. Hang on a sec. Which instrument did you do? My, uh, my Traveler, the 580. <clears throat> but I originally did it on my, uh, my Commander. Uh, so I did it five years ago and I, I took it apart and didn't really play with it much. But since I heard Mike Mineri's stuff, I said, oh, let me put it back together. Um, so I also posted a, a Vibes Workshop link uh, where, I, where I talk about the MIDI vibes. Um, and I have some pictures on there too um, of some of the details. Maybe you guys could pull it up uh, after I play. Um, but let's see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> what I did was um, uh, I, I'm going into my Mac playing Main Stage 3, and I have a flute patch on it. So let's see how it goes. <clears throat> All right, need to turn the sound on. Let's do a sound check also. Let's go. Hear it okay? Yep. Good. Okay.
Yeah, Barry. Sweet, Barry. Mad Lion. Nice. Yeah, man. Cool. Oh, thanks. Describe uh, that tech to us, or did you do that last week? No, I, I could do that. Um, Can you pull up that Vibes Workshop link, Mike? <clears throat> Can't hear you, Mike. You're muted, Mike. I gotta log in, so maybe do a little intro while I prep it. Okay, so um, yeah, um, there's this uh, microprocessor system called Arduino, and it's made for hobbyists. So you don't have to be like an engineer or anything to, to play with it. Like um, art installations use them. Um, it allows inputs, uh, analog inputs, like uh, piezo um, triggers and uh, digital inputs like on off switches to control things. So what I did was um, I got a bunch of piezo disks, wired them up with um, cat six cables and uh, and then I, I actually had to put a, a little circuit um, after the piezos to get the envelope of the um, signal to get the volume instead of it going blah, 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 like that and fade out. It, it actually gets the envelope of the sound. And the Arduinos actually sample how loud it is over time. Um, and that I convert to a MIDI note and uh, we send that over USB. And then there's a program on the Mac called Hairless MIDI that takes the USB um, data and you could route it to the, um, the main stage. Um, it's, it's a proof of concept. It's a threshold and how, low, how loud the note has to be before it generates a MIDI note. Yeah, so uh, I wrote the code so uh, I can set the threshold. Um, however low or high. So, so I've been playing with it for a week now and trying to get, you know, a technique down. Um, it's a little hard because sometimes you want the flute note to come out, sometimes you don't. So I have to do some tweaking, which I haven't done, you know, maybe setting the threshold level, maybe put a, um, a little pot on the uh, potentiometer, a little knob to set the threshold. Um, I haven't done that yet. Um, or it's funny, I went to uh, a, a store, um, a, like an antique store uh, yesterday and I found this uh, switch um, that I'm probably gonna hook up. So what, what I might do with it might be like, uh, maybe this one will be uh, just play the upper uh, notes as, as MIDI and this is the lower and you know have them both on. So I, I'd be able to, <clears throat> To, to switch out what notes are MIDI, and then maybe have a volume pedal that says, uh, I only want a certain amount of uh, MIDI to come through. Um, like in that song I just played, maybe uh, I'd have MIDI in the A section, but not in the B section, or maybe just have the accompaniment as MIDI. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that you can do. Um, it, it's getting complicated. <laughs> I'm um, just. I think it's cool. I, I I like the fact that the the MIDI note cuts off exactly when your note cuts off, but there is a little latency to when the MIDI note appears. Yeah, so you could play around with that. Um, uh, Mike, if if you get a chance to pull up that um, uh, that's that that website. Yeah, and I'll show you how I did the uh the pe okay, uh, let me, click uh, click click on those uh, pictures open up those pictures i gotta make sure my sound is sharing yeah don't 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 play the sound <clears throat> oh just just the, just okay. the pictures yeah um we're low res for some reason or is that just me it might be because i did click the sound thing oh let me try without and also it might help if i just do window there we go cool so we could look at one picture at a time um oh sorry go back th th that's fine yeah so <clears throat> each 
the board is called an Arduino, and each one has 16 analog inputs that maps to each one of those is a MIDI note, which is a, um, a piezo disc, which uh, let me dig up one. <clears throat> So get these, yeah. these piezo discs, yeah. and I bought um, these eighth inch to eighth inch ones. Cut them in half and and then solder them to the disc. Um, if you do get these, make sure you get them with um, some wires already soldered on there because it's a really hard to solder on to the disc itself. I just use the existing solder to do that. Um, and also, here's, um, you can see in the picture, um, the, the Cat6 uh, cable. Each one has four. I could put four of uh, the piezos on there. And, and it goes into that, um, the brown board, which each one of those, uh, you can see those little orange things in the middle of the green, it's a diode and some capacitor in there. That's for the, um, the envelope. Um, so I, I don't go directly into the Arduino. You, I think you can. Um, there's something called a debounce circuit, uh, debounce logic, where you have to sample it and make sure that um, uh, you you have to wait for it to settle, but I, I thought it might be better to have the uh, the circuit in the front so you don't have to do that in the software. Um, so each one of those boards is 16 inputs, and I made two of them. If you go back to that picture, <clears throat> um, so I have two of them. So it's 32 notes that I have in there. I don't have all the vibes uh, notes on there. Uh, but that's fine for my purpose. And then the outputs of those Arduinos are USB. So I have a hub and that hub goes into my Mac and then gets converted into the, the MIDI from USB. And I think that's it for that. But yeah, a lot of wiring. <laughs> and so this one, um, can you, you zoom into that? Without any soldering, like installing a bunch of... Um like crimp on connectors or something for for what could you could like if you use stuff like um connectors that you crimp onto the wires could you get away with not soldering anything for this project soldering is a good skill to learn i'm so terrible at it I no, do it do it it's cool no i had to solder these um females onto there i guess i don't know you got Maybe it. it was just the cheap irons, but I ruined like two or three of them because they just won't stop oxidizing immediately. Uh, I can't solder like anything to anything else. Mike, can you scroll down um, of that picture? There we go. So I, I wedged the uh, sustain pedal huh. on yeah. my vibes pedal. There it is. So uh, that is one input into the Arduino. Each board, yeah, I split it, um, and uh, that's how I cut my notes off or, or sustain them. So I don't have to like sit down and and it it, it would be arg uh, you know pretty uh, hard to uh, to play both pedals. I, I don't have that. So I I kind of um, I guess I concentrate more on the the MIDI sound than the vibe sound when I play the pedal. Um, are they, um, Jay asked, these are contact pickups, right? They're attached to the bar. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I use this, uh, you know, ticky tack or whatever the poster, uh, sticky stuff instead of, um, normally you would, uh, um, do the super glue, but this works fine and I could rip them off. <laughs> I'm not doing acoustic, um, stuff you know it's not it's not a pickup for acoustic it's just triggering the note so i really don't care about sound quality so much 
Yeah, a lot of um, folks, you'll just pick, you'll put a microphone on it to get the acoustic if you want. Right, right. Um, um, but yeah, so. This last picture. Yeah. And that's just showing the, the piezas right on the bar. The, ah. the, the idea is to get them on the node so that it doesn't dampen the, um, damp the, uh, the bar so much. Um, but it works. What if you have like an old Genco? Mm -hmm. I'm speaking for myself. Would it trigger really cool MIDI sounds? Like, no matter what the bar quality really is. I mean, Absolutely. Now could... the thing about MIDI vibes is you can't get rid of the vibe sound unless you like totally muffle it. So oh, really bad, yeah. But uh, but, yeah. but you know if you're recording. Uh, just direct from the MIDI, then you don't hear the acoustic. So, you know, um, so it's, it's a different way of playing. Um, the, my mi original motivation for this was not for the sounds, but to actually be able to transcribe my, my playing. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't done that, but, um, that was my original, uh, idea. The, the other thing I wanted to do was instead of having a sustained pedal for the MIDI note, I wanted to have the pickup control how long the duration of the note is, but that uh, preconditioning circuit that I have on there cuts it off too early. So I, I'm using the, um, the, the, the real pedal, like a piano pedal, electric piano pedal. So the pickup doesn't translate dynamics into a MIDI signal, it's just on and off? Um, you, you can, uh, I don't have that. I think I turned that off. Um, I, I need to do a lot of tweaking. This is not like, um, I mean, if you did that, then the natural dynamics of the bar. Yeah, exactly. Cut the MIDI off because when the, when you dampen the bar, it would, it would go down to zero. Exactly. Um, but I had a problem with, with my input circuit. Um, there's a diode in there and yeah. that, <laughs> what that does is, um, uh, cuts the voltage. It's like 0.8 volts or something like that. And it means that any sound below that threshold won't be picked up. Yeah. So that that's a problem. I, I would need active circuits instead of the passive circuits that I have in there now to, to do it right. Uh, I haven't gotten around to that, but. The damper know. pedal doesn't trigger any accidental MIDI notes. Like if the damper pedal s snaps up and hits. Yeah, I, I haven't had any crosstalk or anything. So let me, let me try that. Nothing. Nothing. So, yeah, it's pretty good. I don't know if it's because I was using that ticky tack stuff versus a. Um, oh, I also did put the threshold up uh, a little bit. So I, maybe that's why it's not doing false triggers. Yeah, you, should, you totally should post on TikTok. Oh, What's wait, TikTok? what? <laughs> Ticky tack, tick tock. No, oh, gotcha. Uh, that's that's this um adhesive tack stuff. Oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> ah very I, good. I used it when it was like this color. It was yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So. Well, I wanted to take a chance. Like you feel good, Barry? Like that was a really good session. Oh, cool. Like, yeah, I wanted to I wanted to kind of move on and ask oh. a few people to like say hi i don't know and then i really want to get to rosie who's come gonna come play a little bit for us talk about her new album and it's i know her through a bunch of stuff i'll say but first i mean i'm seeing new names so i'm i don't know jay like we've been meeting a lot do you want to say hi or are you still probably moving stuff around anybody i see the chat blowing up just like reach out don i don't know if i've really seen you very many times you know, rob that yeah was hello hey where are you from rob yeah i'm from the netherlands very cool i wasn't sure if i got the time right <laughs> so rob was very courageous and he's like what time is this in european time and i'm like thank you for asking like but then I sent Belgium, and I I don't think that there's a few time zones. Cool. 
very cool to see new faces that's that's what this is all about so then like here i am maybe it's even 2019 and i'm seeing rosie circoni does it does it have a knee at the end i like yeah. even messed it up on the live no i i just go with circone um cool. but Thanks yeah for reminding me <laughs> and my name is mike numaye oh no, okay it's <laughs> It I suppose it might be Neumeyer a little bit in Germany. Hey, Mike, before we get into Rosie, because Ro Rosie's going to be awesome, and uh, I really want to hear that, but my lesson is super short, and I, sure. I, I want to play it. Normally, it'd be like, whatever, but um, Tim, I'm, I'm calling you out of my lesson, so so you're going to you have to have a spotlight here for a second. Me? Yeah. So um, on Vibes Workshop, Tim Collins has been making these cool lessons and they're not getting much attention yet. So um, I wanted to play part of one. Um, the one where you transcribe Milt Solo. Like, I think it's real cool. I also didn't write anything on Vibes Workshop, so I'm being hypocritical to say it's not getting attention. But um, so it's, we're not going to play the whole thing because it's like 15 minutes long. But I wanted to play a couple minutes so that if you guys want to go back and do some of the things that Tim is su suggesting in it. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, maybe I'll play it and then if you want to say a couple words or something and then move on to Rosie. Sure. I got sharing on, so I think it's ready for you to share if you want. video we're going to listen to learn and then devise exercises from one of Milt Jackson's first ever recorded solos this is a solo that he played in December of 1945 in his very first professional recording session uh, it's with the singer Dinah Washington and it's a song called no voot no boot it's a 12 bar blues in the key of E flat and uh, we're gonna listen to it a little bit and I will then play the solo for you slowly and we'll break down the individual pieces of it and then I'll show you some ways that I would practice these things to try to incorporate this language into my own playing. It's a very short solo, which makes it a great etude that you can learn and memorize fairly quickly. And then we can do a whole bunch of things from there. So let's get started. Now I had a young Jody. He gave his gold to me. But he was lacking something, so I gave him up, you see, every man. Not build the speed. I'm gonna sit right here on it till I find a man can give me what I need. So that's it. That's the entire solo. So let's go over to the vibraphone and I will play it for you. One, two, three, four. There's a couple of things that I find very striking about this solo, and one of them is the fact that the entire solo is in the top range of the vibraphone. He never plays below this C right here, and that makes it interesting for its range. And also the fact that in those days they were limited with how much time they could record. So in order to fit all the solos in, they have to be super short. So Mill Jackson knows ahead of time he's only got one chorus to play. And he plays this perfectly structured, very bluesy, with some bebop influence solo over the whole blues form. And it really is a work of art. It is a masterful 12 bar solo. I don't know how anybody could play any better when limited to one chorus of blues like that. And this is his first ever professional recording session. Gives you a glimpse into the genius that was Milt Jackson. So let's break apart the riffs. The very first chord obviously is E flat seven. And Milt's first line goes like this.
So one thing that's striking to me about that is first he does that little turn. So that's just an embellishment. It could have very, it could have also been, but I'm pretty sure that he plays a turn on that, the seventh and the octave. So the line that sort of outlines an E flat seven chord, but instead of e flat, outlining the E flat seven with the third, he does it with the four, which makes it an E flat seven sus. Right, so. And then he gives you the third, also with the grace note below, uh, which is something he almost always does when playing the third of the chord in this solo. He, oh, and he never just goes, no, that's that's too boring. You need to have a little inflection on it. So he adds that chromatic approach tone to the third. Also at that time, as far as swing music goes, when you listen to musicians like Louis Armstrong um, that are sort of pre-bebop, the sixth is considered a consonant chord tone to land on on any major triad. And it's very common to hear phrases that will end on the sixth, on this E flat major six. So the phrase ending there uh, is a common thing to the time. I think Milt sort of abandons that more later in his career. Like immediately after this solo was recorded, he started recording with Dizzy Gillespie. And he was already interested in the music of Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie anyway at this time. And you can hear the influence in this solo. But one of the leftovers of the pre-bebop phrase construction, I think, is to play a phrase that ends like the ending on the sixth on an E-flat major chord. So that's, that's something that I find interesting about that solo. So then, let's continue. The next phrase. That is something that's very common in bebop in the fourth bar of a blues. Even though the chord structure is basically E flat seven, the coming chord in measure five is an A flat dominant seventh. And so you get very often bebop players, they will play a two five to the four. So that turns it into a B flat minor seven to E flat seven. And then the next chord being a flat seven. So it sets up that secondary dominant. Now there's two ways you could look at this line. You could look at it as if he's thinking. You could. So I'm going to stop it there. Um, now we've got a, a taste of what Tim's lesson is. Um, if you want to see the whole thing, it's on Vibes Workshop at this link I'm putting in the comments right here. Oh, Jen, a taste of Tim. All right. I'll just say real quick, I've actually been playing that solo every day, kind of like as an etude. And it's I've been playing it in other keys and stuff now because I'm just getting so used to it. It's so short, it's it takes like 30 seconds. Once you know it, it takes 30 seconds to play it. So it's just it's just a great just it's a great thing to know to have as a warm-up. That's all. <laughs> yeah, that's why I like this lesson too. There's like so much that you pack in and you break it down, but the solo is so short that it feels really approachable. So, yeah, everyone should check that out. <laughs> yeah, so I've got like a lot to say. Um, Rosie said, great, so great. Thanks, Tim. And it was, that one was just to me, Rosie. And I just figured I would just translate, you know, transfer the message. Instead no, of I know. It. I realized my mistake and then I resent it. So it did make it to everybody. I just... I and just, then Tim, yeah. like, I wrote, like, Tim sucks, but I accidentally sent it to Tom, but I meant to send it to you. I'm sorry. It's funny. I get, more, I get like, <laughs> seven of those a day. <laughs> you know, and I, that's the segue I wanted to do. Like, I have a screenshot of your YouTube, Tim. Like, you're very inspiring. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I like the way that you've built a, your YouTube up, and I'm... You know, I was like, I'm gonna like look at how he looks at his description and kind of see see how he does things. It all started with a cat. How quick is that story? Uh, I can tell it in 30 seconds, and then we can listen to Rosie play. That's acceptable. Um, yeah. About 11 years ago, my cat was jumping around on the vibraphone, so I filmed it and put it on this new website called YouTube. And then about five years ago, it started going totally viral, and suddenly I had like. 2,000 subscribers 
and then also at the same time i was like wow spotify doesn't really pay very much uh online selling of my albums doesn't pay very much rather than making new albums i'd rather i'll just put my effort into making videos and that's that's basically the short story so you know that's very when cool. i have an idea i post something <laughs> well i'll be reaching out now that the walls are broken through zoom you know and then in the same sense like i started to say 2019 maybe even earlier i'm not sure but then i'm seeing these amazing videos by rosie where it's singing with vibraphone that's really one thing that caught my attention and then awesome like you taught me how to do like instagram stories more entertaining and you like how to actually use emotes in the story and yeah, I, I think I just want to do a quick say and say, you want to play for us right away? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. I just got to move some stuff around. I got I to gotta cop to what Mike was saying. I 100% stole some of that Instagram like vibes when I was like seeing your Instagram stories. I was like, this chick is, is on it. She's doing it the right way. How can, how can we all just try to do it? Oh my gosh, thank you. That's so nice. I just, uh, it was many years of trial and error, mostly. So. so I'm seeing, Rosie and I have had music business conversations, you know, talking about the vocal stuff as well, but we can really just dig into anything here, I think. But I, I know my interests are always talking about music business. 50-50, right? Yeah. Um, cool. All right. I think I'm ready to play. Um, oh, okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, cool. Okay. Wow, look at that bull. <laughs> Behind you. There's somebody who's not muted, I think. Yeah, is there any? I Mike, just muted Brett. He's not Rosie. No, it's not me. Okay, I'm going to mute, and then we should be good. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, like Mike mentioned, well, first off, I'm super excited to be here and talk. And I came to my first one last week because Jen uh, was like, you should come to this. And it's so fun. So I'm excited to uh, come as much as I can, really. Um, but yeah, I just released an album this year um, that's all vibraphone and voice stuff. And then it has a lot of percussion and drum set. And I did all the mixing myself, all the recording myself, all the writing myself. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to play a song from the album and this one's called a uh, love song for the night. <clears throat>
like where my mouth hurts from smiling, Rosie. Wow, someone with talent, really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Yeah, so that um, was Love Song for Night, which is one of the songs on my album. That's called uh, The How and the Why. And I released it uh, just a little over two weeks ago at this point. And on all the major streaming platforms um i can amazing links later but yeah i dropped yeah. a band camp in there oh awesome thank you so much um but but yeah so mike i don't know where exactly you wanted to go with the conversation i'm open to whatever so yeah i'm curious if anybody has any questions mine I know where I want to go, but I want to open the field. I had a quick question, if you don't yeah. mind. Um, uh, just because I, I always have like a, a hell of a time trying to figure out how, like if I'm going to make a video where I like talk and play the vibes. Like I never, I have, I, is that a Rode NT microphone? Is that what that is? Yes. It's okay. One. Yeah. I have one of those. I haven't tried using it yet because <laughs> I always try the the two uh, overheads, and then like I just run back and forth between like my desk where I like I go and sit down and then I talk and then I run back to the vibes and play and like and I always run into the problem when I play and talk at the same time that the sound either you can't hear my voice or the yeah I don't know so yeah I guess yeah. I just wanted to know about the mic because it sounded great the the balance was great with your singing and. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I had a lot of um, figuring it out because I had that same kind of um, problem. When I perform, I actually perform with a headset mic and then we'll, um, yes, yes. Um, Tom, what is that headset mic? I'm actually kind of looking for a new, a new one right now because I don't love mine. Uh, this is by Acacia Audio. It's their Earth, it's called their Earhook, just microphone this is the box for it okay gotcha like a couple hundred bucks off sweetwater nice uh, yeah. i use it i teach online and it's super helpful because you want your voice at like the top of the mix even if you're like i'm teaching drum lessons and stuff but yeah definitely so yeah so to perform i i use that because for a while i tried just having like a microphone over the vibraphone um but it completely limits your ability to move around and like really play the instrument as you're supposed to and um i knew that i didn't want to like sacrifice what i did like what i could play on vibraphone to be able to sing i wanted both to have their full uh capability but yeah for stuff like just like zoom things or um yeah just like quick uh zoom concerts or things like that just putting the sure so that it's directed at my face and not the vibraphone so that it's like tom was saying at the top of the mix um works really well so brilliant yeah i like jen like read my mind because i wanted to make this word joke maybe like tell us about the how and the why of the album <laughs> where yeah, like that's... really and then uh nick's also asked like 
what's the process? How did she, how did they word it? Progress of making the album, or what's the process of making the album? Maybe. Yeah. Um. Good. Good question. So I'll I'll kind of morph do, them Jen. together. Um, but yeah, so I've been like more kind of seriously songwriting, like writing full, um, songs. I, I played guitar growing up and then I came into percussion after, um, and I was always like very okay at guitar. It was more of a avenue to be able to write songs and sing for me. And so, uh, yeah, I started songwriting in like late middle school, early high school, um, some of the songs on the album are actually from my late high school years. I think two of them are. And um, so I just kept songwriting through college while I was getting my music performance major for percussion. And um, I started doing a lot more singing and mallet stuff um, at like 7 a.m. in the practice room when no other percussionists were around and I didn't want them to hear what I was doing because I thought I was being crazy and doing something that wasn't a good use of my time or whatever <laughs> and um and so yeah but then i started playing my music live i was playing it guitar with a couple of my other percussion friends were in the band um and then i gradually was just like you know what i can play my ideas so much more clearly on mallet instruments than i can on guitar because I spend like no time with that, that I started songwriting on the instrument and um, on vibraphone specifically. And then, um, yeah, I just started slowly playing it for people. I would play it in my recitals. Um, if there was like a random thing that they needed one song for, like a showcase day, I would play it. And um and then people would jokingly be like, oh, when's the album? And then at some point I started saying like, 2020, I'm going to make an album. And I had no idea how I was going to make an album. And I knew very little about that process. Uh, but I just kept telling people I was going to do it. So I figured when I got to 2020, I would have to figure out how to do it. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and yeah, and so the, the whole, um, point of the title is I kind of looked at all these songs that were from my late high school and college years, and it's this time of your life that you're really figuring out how to do a lot of things in your life, um, whether it's like you're going to school for a specific job or a specific career, and, you're theoretically learning how to be more of an adult, um, <laughs> theoretically. And, uh, and now I feel like I'm like entering into this part of my life or I started to during these last four years of like figuring out why I'm doing everything that I'm doing. What's the point of it? Um, why do I want to play music? Why do I want to play percussion? Um, what's that put into my life? And so that's, um, that, I felt like that title just kind of summed up what a lot of those songs meant to me and what I was trying to figure out. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I think I answered both those morphed questions, but, uh, but that's how it came to be. And, yeah, so I started recording um, last June um, after I was, I did a lot of planning for three months before of getting all the arrangements and everything like that that I wanted um, thinking through how I wanted the album flow to be. And then I recorded all the vibraphone um, in like three days by myself in a vacant house. Um, so that <laughs> was quiet. And um, that was very intense. And then I slowly added in um, vocals. My boyfriend is a percussionist. He recorded the drum set on it because it was nice to give one piece of the instrumentation to somebody else and um and it was fun to just get to play recording engineer for that and nothing else and um yeah and so then it was just um so I, I really did try to divide it up into like creation recording mixing like I made sure I was done with all the recording before I started mixing um to just try to step into those different roles um, and so, yeah, I, everything took me way longer than I expected, uh, basically, is the biggest thing. I, 
definitely in my mind wanted to be done like releasing it by October and I was like still finishing up mixing by October because it was I mean also last year was insane for all these other reasons but uh but yeah so it was a very long process overall and uh but I learned I learned a lot from it and I can go deeper into any of the parts that people are interested in but um, should yourself yeah. Eric asked let me see I just I'm scrolling the wrong way through a record deal record company or self-published yeah so I um I self-published it so I um just did the distribution through CD Baby um yeah and so that was a really good experience um again that's also partially why stuff took so long is because I was doing all the creation of the album but like I this album I don't think I will ever do this again but I did I also made like all the cover art um the I had a friend of mine do the photography for it but as far as like the designing because I also made some hard copies of the album so I um I designed all of that I got a media arts minor as well so I had to take a bunch of design classes um in college so they came in handy I guess so that's good but uh um yeah so I, there was just every little bit I was involved in and I like I said don't love the idea of doing that all over again because it is so so much work but it was also really valuable to understand how every part of the process works and what exactly you need um and so I'm really glad that I did it all myself because I think I have a way better understanding of the business side of it and that's important to me going forward to be able to understand what everything takes so I think that is important it's like someone that climbs up to be the president of a company if they started like in the mail room that's a good thing so then they learn every part of the way i wanted to ask you what youtube video you want me to show a little bit of i would like everybody to be aware of your youtube and <laughs> how i really feel like it's cool Cool. You want to talk oh. about that, or should I introduce it? Or uh, you can let me see. I hadn't thought which one. You can just pull up the one I posted yesterday if you want. Um, so YouTube is a a very new realm for me. I I mean I posted covers like when I was in high school and stuff for a long time, and a lot of my recital stuff is up on there um, from college. But I kind of decided in the last few months that I wanted to um more uh i wanted to post some more content about my journey uh because especially getting i'm I'm sure so many of you can relate to this um i'm sure this is not a new story at all but got out of music school was really excited was also in the middle of a pandemic so i couldn't perform definitely thought performing was going to be like one of the main ways i was going to make money out of college um obviously not the case and so i've had just like i've just had so many conversations and so much time to think about what i want from my life and how i want to structure my music career um because there's a lot of different areas that i'm interested in because i'm like i'm doing some random video music scoring projects for some science videos of all things um i'm doing a couple of little film composition things for some friends i'm done like very very minimal commission work as well as perform and write my own music and so i'm trying to figure out a balance of all this while also like still working a day job and figuring out just how to support myself and so i kind of wanted to start my youtube channel now when I'm in the middle of really not having it figured out um, <laughs> to kind of document the process of um, where somebody comes from, from really not knowing what they're doing, honestly, to hopefully 10 years down the line, having a really successful music career that I know I can have. I'm just not there yet. And so, um, so yeah, so far my YouTube videos have been much like kind of sit down and 
just like talking about where I'm at in my life <laughs> and um and I say a lot in my videos that it's like I don't know if it, this will be interesting to people right now in this moment but I think five years down the line when I've gotten somewhere and I've documented this whole process um it'll be a different story so Mike if you want to share just the first couple of minutes of it that's exactly I'll just share just a little bit and great then there's a two other subjects at least that people are and Rosie's back 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 to the friend, friend, friend. Hello, welcome back to the channel. My name is Rosie. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's just, it's, it's nice to be back because uh, you remember that one time a while ago when I said I was going to upload to YouTube every week and then I totally didn't upload to YouTube every week. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that too. And uh, I want to talk about that today. <laughs> also, I just want to do um, a general career update for you all, because that's kind of why I said I was going to start um, this YouTube channel, because for those of you that are maybe here for the first time, I am a recent music school graduate. I graduated in 2020. And I was let out into the world as a percussion performance major, um, also a singer and a songwriter and a producer, but you know, in the COVID world where you can't perform and not really knowing what I wanted to do besides music, it's been an emotional roller coaster, let's just put it that way. So I would love to give you an update of where I am with some cool things that have happened. Ha ha, tease. You gotta go watch it. But I like that segue and Rosie and I have talked about it where sometimes you might have another weird job that you have to figure out how it works with a music career. Maybe there's you have to work up to there where it's a tipping point and you can go all music, right? Is that? Yeah, no, that's definitely... Um... What I've been trying to figure out, I had a lot of weird jobs last year. Um, I did, I did a like a local delivery. It was basically like Grubhub or DoorDash, but it was like a local one. Um, I did that for a, quite a bit of last summer. Um, I worked in an ice cream shop for a while. Ended up quitting because of COVID restrictions here. They cut my hours down to five hours a week. And I was like, well, this is barely any money. So I switched jobs. And then um, I recently just got a job um, working at the front desk of a gym. And I plan on talking about that. And, um, you know, they're, they're definitely, none of those jobs are related to music. And in an ideal scenario, I would probably have a part-time job that does relate to music and I'm gonna keep like searching for something like that and I'm planning on I'm talking to a couple of different studio places in town where I could start teaching some lessons as well because um, I just don't have um, this space looks like it would be good but it's in the upstairs of like a shared house so it's not ideal for having students here and um and I've done some Zoom things as well. But anyway, getting off, off track. Um, so yeah, ideally it would be great to have a day job that is involved with music. But um, the other side of it is that I get to completely leave that work when I leave it and just go all into my own music and not feel burned out in the slightest on my music stuff. Um, and yeah, I have a couple videos on my channel about searching for day jobs and talking about day jobs. And uh, I, I guess I just always, when people talk about getting a day job, they make it sound like you have to find, th that you have to and you can find this perfect fit, like right off the bat for fitting it in with your music career. And that's not what I have found. Maybe some people can get that, but I have definitely not found that perfect fitting uh, day job and I've narrowed down the things that are important to me like having a schedule that stays pretty locked in so that I can focus on my music easier um, and having yeah having something that's just really stable mostly um, 
and doesn't make me feel like I'm frantically figuring out my life. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely, it's not ideal, but it also gives me the motivation to figure out my music career sooner and like really kick my own ass into gear really. So, um, so yeah, exactly. Just like that, Mike, just like that. Any thoughts on that subject? <laughs> yeah, I have thoughts on that. I, I, I worked a day job for 33 years uh, and I played the whole time. Um, and it did not destroy music. In fact, it made it so I didn't have to play weddings. And I didn't have to do music I didn't like. I mostly worked with bands that performed original music for the last 20 years of that day job. Uh, had really good opportunities. It's a lot like what Rosie's saying is you, you gain uh, you gain provenance, you gain sovereignty over your music when you have something else. I mean, you know, back in the day, all musicians had, you know, some aristocrat was was their patron and they that's how they got that's how they got through that's how we have all of the great european musicians that they, they all had somebody paying their freight and in these days you know you can have that still or you can have yourself as your own patron even people who pr play music full time you know a lot of them would say oh i play music full time but then if you really dig down a, a notch deeper either they teach half the day or they're on the phone booking gigs half the day or, or something. I mean, you know, there's a handful who are, you know, blessed to have that 100% all in thing and they have other people doing it for them. And, you know, I, that's, that's wonderful, but it's, it's certainly day jobs are not the end of the world. Um, and like you say, you, you go home at night from a day job you don't really love. And the blessing is, Hey, you can let that go and your mind space is free. I mean, if you really care about your day job, you're going to go home at night and you're going to sweat about, oh, what do my boss think about what I just did? Did, did I screw up in that meeting or whatever? It's like, eh, the hell with it. You know, let's, let's, uh, you know, let's play some bebop, you know? Um, so yeah, absolutely. Everything you're saying, Rosie, I, I, uh, I've got a few more years under the belt than you and, and I've been doing it since I was your age. And absolutely. I, you know, I raised two kids, put them through college, the whole nine yards and I've been blessed. I haven't toured the world, never got famous or anything, but I live in Philadelphia and I've been blessed to play with the best musicians on the planet. You know, um, it's, uh, it can happen. It can, it totally can happen. So just, you know, you're on the right track, I think. So words of encouragement for you. I, I love what you're saying. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, and means a lot to hear it from other people, uh, you know, and I know I like that's the thing. I know that a lot of people are thinking these same things and living these same lives. And part of why I wanted to put it on YouTube is um, just because I feel like it's not openly talked about enough. And I know that somebody commented in the chat that colleges should really rethink what they're teaching and everything. And I completely agree with that. And I loved going to music school and I don't regret it at all. Um, but I also feel like I missed some really key pieces of information of what having a music career is actually like. And so I would love, um, so yeah, I just, I love having these kinds of conversations because I think it's so important and I would love to help kids that are just going into college right now, um, for their amazing music career that they're so excited to have which it can be it's just there's a lot of little pieces that they don't know about so yeah i like i like jay's comment and tim agreed with it and i teach music business as a course realizing that i did not have that offered to me <laughs> and so i tend to really enjoy that because i'm giving them a really good landing strip or takeoff strip, I guess it would be. I want to give them that realistic idea. Um, I bring in guest artists so that they can hear from real people who sometimes are working in different income streams. Yeah. I'm thinking someone had Mike the Real. Thanks, Eric. 
someone had a question. Nix had a question. What about your songwriting process, I think? Oh, yeah. We'll get to that Carolyn's question as well. Cool. Yeah. Um, my songwriting process, I think there's not like a set way that it goes every single time or i'm let me i'm sorry she yeah. let me just give you this in case it inspires your answer Sounds what good. inspires your songwriting when you write a song or have an idea do you take notes or write it at the moment you think about it gotcha yeah so i think um since most of my songwriting is like um pop music basically i don't actually i have rarely written out my vibraphone parts like note for note i normally just write down chord changes um and then i'll have more specific parts that i will figure out over time as i'm writing the song um and i will just kind of uh build it into the way i play it but yeah I, basically there's a there's a few songs i can think of that i have that i play pretty much exactly the same every time um but most of them there's some kind of variation in it and so um so yeah when i think of a a song idea my biggest friend is definitely just recording it on my phone um whether it's a melody idea or a vibraphone um, just recording it on my phone and sometimes I will write then um, sit down and like really try to start fleshing it out and see what comes from it but a lot of times I'll just like record that little piece quickly and I'll be like cool that's there and then I'll come revisit it in a couple of days um, and or I'll like revisit the same idea without adding to it for a couple of days and then I'll finally jump into it uh, yeah, and I think the, I guess what inspires me to write a song is usually, um, like, it, I, I definitely write songs from a place of, like, what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking. Um, I'm starting to get more into, like, storytelling songwriting, I guess, so not necessarily from my point of view, uh, but I haven't done a lot of that yet, so... Um, a lot of times it'll start just like with an emotion that I'm feeling and I'll kind of improvise on vibraphone around that. Um, and generally, uh, I don't have lyrics that will come to me right away, but like a melodic line will come to me. And if you sing it out loud, <laughs> it's, it's hard not to sound like a crazy person. If you sing it out loud, um, you can kind of like hear syllables start to form that will lead you to what the word is. Um, this is, I know this is not like a really step-by-step -step, uh, process, but that's generally what I do. I, um, the first little bit is just so much about exploration and just seeing what happens. And then once you get like a line down that you're like, okay, I think I can go with this. That's when I sit down and really start to like clarify like the theme of the song, the core of the song. Um, so yeah, but really the, what inspires me, um, is just like the desire for wanting to write and um, just going off of what I'm feeling in that moment, so. Actually, can I use that to segue into a question that I've been uh, wanting to ask since you played earlier? Um, yes. Just, you, you, I think you talked about it a little bit and I just wanna go more into like, or I want you to go more into that process that you have. I don't know, when it comes to, 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 to getting it out there actually on the instrument, like you talked about how um, you mainly just notate chord progressions. Mm -hmm. And then, like, for example, when you played uh, just, a, just a while ago, um, what the, the couple things that stuck out to me were, like, the some of the harmony choices that you were making within the song. Like, you, I mean, you've obviously, like, kind of stuck to your guns and sort of, like, deciding to write pop music, but there's a lot of other elements that you're incorporating that go maybe outside of the pop music spectrum. I want to know like what your influences are for that. And a little bit about how you talked about like just having a chord progression, like how much are you working out underneath the melody, what you're singing in the middle? It seems like you might've been improvising a little bit. Like I want to know more about what actually happens for you, like on the instrument in terms of working things out or improvising and just writing like chord charts or what, what that looks like for you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, like you said, I like, basically what I title my 
music as is like pop me I I actually really I change it every time somebody asks me because I don't completely know what to call it uh but people really won't usually I know you guys would be understanding but like the ev the everyday person would not be understanding if I couldn't tell them they just they just keep pestering until I'm like oh my god it's indie and they're like okay cool and so um anyway uh but but yeah so I I title it pop music because I feel like it's pretty easy listening there's nothing like that's like really like difficult or like takes a lot of brain power to sit through I don't think and so that's kind of why I title it as pop music in... yeah, but then you have these like massive flat nine arpeggios in your music so I'm just wondering where the juxtaposition <laughs> is there yeah exactly no I I understand that um so yeah I played so I played in jazz band all through college um so I've played a lot of jazz I was mostly a drum set player um but I started getting into jazz vibes um I, well, I played it all through college, but really in my last few years, um, I I am nowhere near where most of you are. I will say that I it's uh, I am in so much awe and respect of what you all can do, but okay. um, but I but yeah, so I definitely have like a lot of jazz um, influences, and I'm just used to. Jen, that was like a one time wonder, um, but. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so I definitely have a lot of jazz influences and that's like how I learned to play vibraphone was through jazz. And so I think, um, but if you go back to how some of these songs sounded before, um, I would play them on guitar, they were very, very straightforward pop. So some of these songs were written like on the album, some of the songs were written for vibraphone specifically and some of them were written on guitar and then I placed them onto vibraphone and that's where I started to add like a lot of jazzier elements because that's what vibraphone sounds like to me I think um but if I was to play them on guitar they would sound like a straight pop song absolutely like they would not sound like that and so um so really it's just me um it, yeah, I just basically I'll start with really um, just straight up triads usually when I'm songwriting. I'm not usually, I, I think more now I will start with interesting colors right at the beginning of my songwriting process. Um, but usually I'll start with just really basic things, figuring out how to make, so I know my foundation is there, right? And, and um Sorry, I'm getting so excited and I'm like eating up my own words. And oh, I need to take a breath one second. Okay. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> that was that's cookie monster. Um, I understand you talk about like the colors that you that you're choosing for your songs, but curious like what you're doing in the uh in the middle part, like were you improvising over this harmony that you've set out? Have you kind of worked out some formal things to play? Is it a combination? Yeah, so the middle section of what I played that was improvised and usually when I play live I'll play um with Hayden my drummer and so we'll like open that up as like a little solo section and stuff like that and so so yeah and that's just and then I'll I'm soloing over the the four chords that I'm going in between for those chord changes um and yeah so pretty much all my songs have some areas of improvisation for sure um, but yeah, but then when I'm singing, I mean, obviously singing and playing is hard. And so usually when I'm singing, I'll be pretty set in what I'm playing. I will come back to the same things and how I formulate those parts basically is I just see what sounds good and what I keep coming back to, like what my hands want to keep coming back to, um, because I feel like, well, if my hands already want to do that, there's no point in making it harder and making myself do something that they absolutely don't want to do. Um, but then again, I'm also in my own practice constantly trying to strengthen my ability to sing whatever I want while I play whatever I want and learning how to have those happen simultaneously. Um, so that is a, that is a constant um, process and learning experience. 
Well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing a little bit of that side of the process. I think you're going to be like the next Diane Crawl, the vibraphone or something. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for letting me freak out in the middle when I um, just got way too excited. So I forgot what I was going to say, but I am like the bad kid in class, like chatting away in the chat box here. And uh, but I want to ask Carolyn's question. Like, how did we even meet? Well, you have such a great social media image that I found you. But it seems so hard to make something like that with all of the camera angles and everything that goes into it and the commitment of posting on all of the platforms. So like anything that you can give us like tips or your process of social image creation and self-promotion. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I would say, um, the, I was, I've been posting like vibraphone or I guess just mallet invoice videos for probably about three years now. Um, and so like a lot of what you see and like, I don't, I can't even remember how many followers I have at this point because it doesn't actually matter. But, um, but that like all that audience has grown over a really really long time and like i think a lot of people when they talk about social media they they do like to talk about like oh here's how you get more followers fast honestly i don't think i have any answers for how to grow your following fast there's like a million other people that say they're gurus about that on the internet and so you can go ask them how they do that um, but really, it's just like a long, consistent um, time of posting. And I think what has been most successful in how I post is that um, I post pretty regularly. That definitely does make a difference, for sure. I think nobody would um, say that's wrong. Um, but I also, when I think of like branding myself, I... I pull from things that I already am or am striving to be. So like, I I don't write how, I, I write my captions very similarly to how I talk. And I um, do my Instagram stories with videos. And again, I'm not really trying to be any different than how I am. My goal is always that if somebody met me in person, they would be like, oh, you are who you are on social media. And I think that takes a lot of the stress out of branding yourself because if you're just like trying to share who you are, you don't really have to do a lot of planning or, I mean, you, you still have to plan out your content sometimes, I guess, but you don't, you don't have to manufacture anything. You just already have it. You can, if you like give yourself the freedom to be like, okay, the, my brand is me. Like, I'm just going to talk about the things that I like, the things that I want to show to the world, the things that I think are important. Um, then it's, it's just a place to share. And it's not this like big stressful show that you have to put on. Um, definitely in the last uh, year, I would say I've been focusing on trying to make it a little more professional and less of like uh just like a personal Instagram page and so um I think a big part of that is definitely like at some point getting some branding photos that just make you look like hey she took the time to like take these photos and really show what she does that's huge and gives you the ability to like if you want to talk about something but you're like I don't know what picture to post with this you just have a backlog of stuff um so that's really helpful to do some kind of branding photo shoot at some point um let's see yeah but I think I just really I'm just really careful to make sure that I'm not saying things that other people want me to say and not jumping on trends just because it's a trend and uh yeah no I am um, and if people don't like something I post that's that's on them because I am just being me so um I guess that's that is really my branding strategy I suppose um but yeah my mother-in-law had a motto 
If you're not on someone's shit list, you're not trying hard enough. That's a good motto. <laughs> nice, Randy. Some good mantras. Uh, well, is there anything that I kind of missed in the chat? I think this has been wonderfully inspiring. Rosie, you've inspired me to just be more open. Like, and now I'm talking about my job at Gruno in my lives, where usually I was like, no, this is the music mic. <laughs> music mic. But now I'm like embracing it. And yeah. No, I think I that think, you're right. And I think, especially like with every social media platform being so um, extremely oversaturated like people like to connect with real people and people like to support real people and i guarantee that you are all wonderful people and just like the more that you can let people into your life um and like you don't have to overshare like crazy like i don't want to know what you ate for dinner every single night but like um, but if you love to cook and that's a big part of your life, then do share it. You know, like I just, um, people, people want to, I, I guess what I found, especially because I started like a Patreon last year and things like that is people actually want to support me doing music. They don't really want to support my music. They want to see me succeed. They don't care about the music just by itself succeeding so um so yeah i guess i would say that too and uh what about the people around you uh what do you mean what about the people around me oh i can't hear you i don't know talking. he froze up we just lost him right as he asked that question oh no but uh if 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 Rob comes back, we'll uh we'll figure it out what he meant. Okay. I actually don't know. Cool. Uh -huh. Thanks, well, Rob, Sarah. Back now. What was your question, Rob? Maybe type it in. Well, as we're kind of like wrapping up, I do want to say Jay has this awesome Zoom setup going on. And I'm thinking, like, if we don't listen to him today, we should plan for him next week, maybe. I mean, if that's cool. The next five minutes, then then I'd be down. Yeah, I'd be down too, Jay. What do you think? Do you want to test it out today? Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh, we we could try it. Um, yeah, you play I say go for it because it's ready. All right. all right. Thanks. Yeah. So. I mean, that, um, part part of what I'm doing is trying to set this up for um, my students so they can see me, and um, I do have I usually will have a couple of different angles and everything, um, and get a really clear sound. Uh, today, it's I'm actually using a little bit different uh, microphone, and thanks Tim for your microphone showdown video uh, for that. Um, just kind of you know arranging everything um, and. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of test it. Actually, I have, I have another monitor. I have my computer right here so that when I am teaching one-on-one -on -one with my students, it is as clear as possible. So um, uh, right now I'm working on, and it's in the process of being worked on, a piece by Villalobos. It's Prelude Number 2 um, on guitar. And um, all right, let's, uh, let's just do it. Oh, wow. Let's go. Awesome.
Yeah, man. Very yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for letting me play. <laughs> that was it right so, there. Uh, hopefully that uh, when um, the one thing I haven't figured out is to have um, some type of monitor system where I don't have to wear the headphones. Um, but yeah, so I, I have to take my headphones off when I'm playing in order to kind of uh, move around the keyboard like that. But if anyone has any ideas, please leave them in the chat. <laughs> if you set up, I mean, you can do some stuff with setting up like a DAW session in the background that might give you a little bit of ability to, to monitor yourself. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking about the hands-free microphone. We talked about a bunch of different options. That's helped me a lot. And I can talk to them while I am sh literally showing them the shapes. Yeah, I think I'm always on headset. I'm always I always have a headset mic and I'm like wearing headphones and you're just like kind of fully immersed in the deal. It makes the lessons really interactive when you can just be fully focused. You're not thinking about your other stuff. I you just have speakers. Um, why do you need a monitor? Well, because of the thing called feedback, Larry. I'm not getting any feedback. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just I know that it's possible to not get feedback with a monitor set up. You just got to be careful about how you place things. Yeah, I had a little trouble when I, I, I attempt and, and again, um something that i'm trying to do is keep it like kind of as low budget as possible um you know with COVID and everything it's been very difficult to um play <laughs> so uh it, it you know uh how do i put this i i'm trying to do it as cheap as possible basically and i when i first attempted it i you know the setup just wasn't working so uh, I, I have i have a less than two dollar assist for you that will okay. work with what you're doing I, i'm looking at the position of your headphone cables and it's in front of you this little thing i don't know if you can see it on on the monitor here but it's a paper clip one of these little butterfly paper clips is that visible yeah yeah okay well if you put your your microphone or your headphone cables through that right then you can run the cable behind your back and clip this to the bottom of your belt in back and the cable will stay behind you the entire time you play and it will not get tangled in your arms. Yeah, Randy. I've been doing this since like <laughs> But you know, it's a simple thing like that where that just didn't even occur to me. So thank you. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much. These things are great. I sometimes run it through my belt on the on the back. Right. Same but, thing. But exactly, but that's harder to get off. This you can take off when you have to when you have to work around, you know. The problem is when you forget you have the headphone cable and you walk away to go to the kitchen or something. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's like pulling out of the gas station with a pump still hooked up. Oh my gosh, I've been there and but uh, how hey, many solos do I have where I'm like adjusting? Sorry, Tom. Oh no, sorry, Mike. I wasn't mean to talk over you. But I was just say, Jay, your setup looks great, dude. Oh th thank you. Like, whoever your students are are gonna be stoked. I hope so. <laughs> They, think, they put up with a lot of different like, variations and stuff. So that's cool. That's cool. I'm changed. I literally change my setup on my students every single week. They have no idea what's going on. It's because it's always trying out new stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, some of them though need to uh, work on their setup just a little bit. Oh yeah. Well, that's like the other thing is like you spend all this time passing like a thousand dollar audio pathway through a zoom lesson just so your student can like go through the laptop, go through the mic on their cell phone. Mm -hmm. Feels that way. Well, Bye, everybody, thanks, Rosie. You're uh, awesome. Yeah, Rosie, that was awesome. Thank you guys for having me, and I'm excited to come back and. Yeah, definitely be part of the hang. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Or have we're... some like new music you wanna, you know, just do like a special uh, appearance for. Like, we'll definitely we're a guinea pig audience. Sweet. We're yeah. Audience here every week. Sounds good. So like the way it used to be is that we all were kind of like playing and then it kind of paused. We, so yeah, I think come back, come back. Anytime someone wants to play, do it. But then maybe we'll start a little bit of this guest type of thing where it's. I mean, we've been guesting for a while now, man. We've been having. Yeah, consistent maybe like. Years. But also I miss the, like the playing or we used to like all play a bunch. Like I want to play more. Yeah, I really liked when we had the free improv thing like that got me into that like now I, I i started doing that when i was busking after doing that here i was less 
free improv, but yeah, I'm super down. <laughs> <laughs> but even like, even having like, just having that thing where like three, pe- we chose three people that were going to play and then like you have that commitment. I mean, yeah. like, okay, I'm going to play, you know. <laughs> people are going to play and then people have to actually. Yeah, why not? Yeah. In fact, let's start it up again. I volunteer. I will play next week. <laughs> yeah, I'll, why not? I'll play too, you know, we'll just go for well, it. Now all we're right. all doing it. <laughs> And Brian rose his hand, so there we go. We got three. We're good. Who else raised their hand? Oh, Brian. Yeah, Brian. let's go. Oh, good connection. Awesome. All right. Yeah, somebody write it down because we're all going to forget. I'll remember. Okay, cool. Uh, so No, me- I'm not going to play, but I would really like everybody to check out this video. It's brand new. I would have played it next week, but we already have three players. Mike, you can still like play a video or something yeah. like that. For that. There's no format for here next that- week. Cool. I'm prepped. Since when have had a, a very so concrete fo- format? <laughs> yeah, Mike, that's right. not. We can't. No, we can't have that, man. We are. Yeah. Doing- no. Absolutely not. Um, that's terrible. <laughs> All right, on that note, uh, thank you, Rosie. Thank you, everyone else who was here. I'm just going to go ahead and do Mike's job and wrap this up for him. Otherwise, he's going to turn into the cookie monster. I will. See you, everybody, next week. I'll post this on YouTube. Oh, yeah, do that. See ya. Ah.